Okay, well, I'm going to be uh, speaking on the topic of uh, intentional support circles uh, as a form of uh, helping sustain people with their lives and as a very practical form that sort of developed over many years. Um, uh, and it's important just to remember that it is possible to uh, help people uh, with their lives uh, simply by being present to people in some kind of supportive way, usually with some kind of in a small intentional network. Now, um, the uh, why is that important? Well, uh, there are lots of people that are very socially isolated. And uh, one of the things that's really tough on people is isolation. And just having people present in your life uh, of course, through all kinds of studies, have shown it's a very important part of getting the good life. Most people don't say, get up every morning and say, oh, I wish I could be more isolated. You know, it'd be so much, so much better. Uh, but uh, there are days I'm sure you would like to be more isolated. But on the whole, that's because you have the benefit of relationships. So... Uh, and there was a time that we didn't have a term for this uh, intentional supported, uh, supportive networks uh, because they were just how people lived. They had a network of people. But as, uh, as we uh, uh, developed as a society, we developed a whole lot more isolated people for various reasons. And uh, we've had to be a bit more intentional then about uh, supporting people. And, and helping people that don't have networks create them. And that uh, is uh, something that we've seen much more of uh, in the last uh, quarter century of people that have been able to help people build a network of some sort for themselves. Um, now, uh, even with a network, it doesn't mean life's good. But having nobody in your life uh, to support you is not so good either. So it's important to know that you can help people create networks if they don't have them now. Um, and um, uh, what makes these networks important or uh, you know, very uh, person-centered in that sense is that they're built around a person. It's a network intentionally created for somebody and with somebody. So it's a network that is custom-made uh, where the person would welcome people sort of into their network or add people to their network. And uh, this can be done over time. Um, and the individual himself may not necessarily be a person that can build their own network. Some can. Uh, but others may need some help uh, inviting people into their life and forming some kind of a network in some way that will work for them. So for those of you that think of uh, being person-centered, there could be nothing more person-centered than one person at a time, the focus point for some kind of network of people rallying around that person. Mm -hmm. um, now, if you were starting from scratch to do that, it takes some time to build up a network. Um, so in this sense, you don't go to you know, support circles are us and you know, get the daily special. You really uh, have to kind of uh, have a process to cultivate a network. Um, and many people, uh, one of the issues that comes up a lot is people are, aren't, are a little bit um, shy about asking people to be in their network and to, uh, to do that. And so sometimes it's good to have a good asker, somebody that's sort of shamelessly good at approaching people and asking them to do things. And there are some people who are very gifted in that way. They have no shame, no, <laughs> no inhibition, no resistance. They'll talk to anybody as if they like them, you know, and they get places. So we need people like that. So if you're going to have people help people develop a network, you need people that are a bit sort of pushy about uh, approaching people uh, and inviting them uh, to do something on this. But it does take time to put that together um, in the sense that, uh, like, who would you want in a network? And, of course, you don't know. 
the person may not know, you know, who they would want. Mm. And uh, they don't even know, in a sense, what, uh, you know, what would be the process of finding them. And, you know, how does it all work? You know, how does you do this? Well, uh, if you think about it, uh, it's really uh, going to be a little different from one person to another. Because if you're sort of working alongside somebody to help them build a network, uh, that's going to be a one-person kind of uh, focus because you're really focusing on what that person wants in their network, not network 101, you know, generic, you know, off-the-shelf network because the nature of building a circle for people is to build it so that it suits them. That will be the circle they want of people uh, in their life. Uh, you can't really go to a place called Circles Are Us and say, I'd like the monthly special, and they'll send over six interested people or whatever, and you now have your ready-to-go network, just add water, stir, and away you go. It's really a s series of invitations to people, and uh, many of the people that may be approached aren't sure that they are the right person. So it's not like people are lining up to be the right person. And they may say, well, what's involved? You know, what, what are you asking? What's the nature of the ask in terms of, um, you know, what's expected of me and so on? Now, I think it's uh, very helpful in instances like that to, if people don't know much about how these intentional networks work, is to have some kind of educational resources of some form to explain the concept a little bit and to uh, and there are some resources that are, you know you can read or videos and things like that or simply talk to people about your own experience with uh, these uh, circles uh, now how many people are in a circle or a network well it could be as little as one and as many as may want to be a part of it so there isn't, like, you don't have to go to the registry of circles and get a permit for a, a mini circle or a moderate or a large circle. Mm -hmm. uh, the idea with circles is to create the circle that's most comfortable for the person, the types of people, the number of people, and so on. So there isn't really a set thing. The, the people don't come and see you from the inspectorate of circles to validate that you're doing it properly. You, you can basically not do it properly and still uh, be making headway. So, um, the, uh, so people, in a sense, themselves can contribute to the uh, formation of their circle the way they would like it to be, if, if you could put it that way. And they may not know that, uh, exactly what they like. So if you can think about it that way, people may kind of do it a step at a time, or a person at a time, uh, in terms of adding uh, people to their network. And uh, lots of people can help in doing that. Not everybody can, but some people can help. And if the person themselves uh, do doesn't really know how to kind of proceed, then uh, you can get people even temporarily involved in the process of you know, sorting out, well, who should be approached and what's the nature of the approach, what's the ask, uh, and what's the commitment that people are going to make uh, to uh, some kind of circle. Um, and uh, it's also true that where you start with a circle may not be where you end up. Because over time, uh, who's in the circle changes the nature of the circle. And, you know, what, what works for the person may change uh, in a sense that uh, their needs may change over time. So the circle you thought you needed two years ago may not be the one you need now. If life has moved on. So if you think of it this way, you're really, you can evolve it or tinker with it or modify it uh, de de depending on whether it's meeting uh, the person's need. Um, uh, a lot of this depends as well on the person's circumstances of life. Uh, this is also a thing to keep in mind. If the, your starting point is creating, helping somebody create a circle 
for themselves or a network for themselves, and they start out already in crisis, then that's a very different starting point where people's other parts of their life are fine. So in this sense, not everybody's starting point's the same. So you just have to deal with whatever the starting point is, whatever the cards uh, fall as to, well, you know, where's the best place to begin and, uh, and, and how might we proceed. Um, and um, many of the people that you might approach may have no idea what an intentional support circle is or a network. And so, as you can imagine, you're going to have to explain that to people. Like, what do I do in a circle? Do I need a permit? You know? Is this legal? You know? Uh, do I have to sign confidentiality documents? You know, people have lots of questions, and the answer is no, you don't have to sign confidentiality documents, but it would be nice to be discreet if you're up to it, um, because this is somebody's personal life, and uh, so some of these things are quite reasonable questions, like what's the ethics of being a supporter of someone, what, you know, and uh, what, and that, of course, must be determined by what the person themselves is worried about, you know, or am I, uh, you know, do I have any privacy, for instance, you know, uh, these kind of questions may arise. Uh, also, supporters aren't necessarily good with every kind of person they've ever met. Uh, so you may approach people that are good. Uh, with some people not so good with another, other people. So the supporters themselves may have limitations. It's not like you, you go to some school where they teach you how to be a good member of a support circle, you know, and you, you take some exam and you, you, know, you have your freshly minted support circle approved human being uh, statement. Uh, so people themselves... Uh, uh, the people that are the supporters also have their own limitations and may be inexperienced about just how all this works. And in this way, um, uh, the educational aspect of this is very important. People have lots of questions. Who's going to answer the questions? Because if you have no answer to the questions, people aren't going to be very satisfied with that. And what are the types of questions that come up? There could be anything under the sun. And so a very important question is, is who's going to answer the questions? And it may not just be one or one person, maybe a couple of people are going to take the lead on organizing this little network, um, and uh, it'll fall to them to answer whatever the questions are that people might have who are unfamiliar. Now, uh, you may be lucky enough to live in an area where you have other people that are sort of involved in uh, their own networks. And that's great if they're willing to help you because they can use their example to make it a little more concrete for people that, you know, have never encountered uh, anything like this before. And uh, But that isn't always the case ne necessarily, that there would be people that you know of that have a support circle and that somebody from that support circle is available to kind of talk to people and answer questions, that sort of thing. Um, uh, but that would be helpful if you're in, in a community where some other people have circles. By all means, capitalize on that. Now, it is, you know, of course, uh, now quite a ways along from when people started building these intentional networks, you know, in uh, many, many jurisdictions. So we now have lots of resources that are out there about just people's experience with circles. You know, there's videos, there's books, there's articles. Um, and uh, some of that can be very helpful for people that are just trying to get their head around what's involved in it. And uh, so it would be very good to link to some of those resources if you can. Uh, not everybody even knows that they exist, but there are resources where people are really just telling their story of what, how their little network was created. Uh, now, the... Um, a very key question here is, this is a circle for someone. And so the defining of what the circle's role is will depend on how the person themselves defines what they want from a support circle. You know, and it may be that they don't know. 
uh, that uh, people will just have to explore that question. The person themselves, you know, never been in a support circle before. The supporters not may not be a part of it. So uh, it doesn't mean you're a failed circle at that point. It just means you're getting your feet wet. And so it's not a sign of a, you know, kind of an inadequacy of the circle that people aren't sure what to do and how to do it and so on. But uh, if you don't launch it, you'll never get through all those kind of questions. So in this sense, uh, starting small, just one, one supporter at a time, builds up a number of supporters who could then uh, potentially uh, sort of carry it the next wave. So, um, and you don't need a permit to do this. In, in uh, both Canada and the United States, I've checked, it's not illegal to have people in your life. You know, um, unless they're up to something illegal, but, uh, you know. That's true. Uh, so, uh, and um, it's basically a private matter as well. This is not a public matter. This is a private matter is how people want to invite people into their life and uh, whatnot. And so it's important to remember whose circle it is and whose privacy is most important in all this. As, uh, the supporters want privacy as well, too, but certainly the person uh, uh, for whom the circle uh, is formed may have very strong opinions about what they want talked about outside the circle uh, and what's okay to talk about. Uh, in, in that sense, that leaves them in the driver's seat. And that may change as well as, you know, over the months and years. Uh, now, some people may think that, uh, you know, a support circle or an intentional network is a kind of collective effort. And it may be. It may be that they do meet as a group. Sometimes that is the case at times. But there are other times when the person prefers one-on-one -on -one relationships, one at a time, and doesn't like any of this kind of group uh, coming together type things. They just want the one-on-one -on -one relationships. Uh, and that may not be clear to them at the start, and it may not be clear to the supporter as well. So in this sense, there, uh, people may just prefer, the person may prefer just to have, have people sort of in relationship with them, separate from the other people that are in the circle. So it's not like circle is necessarily everybody together all the time. But there may be occasions when it becomes very easy to do that, and people know each other, and it's kind of a little sort of mutual network at that point. Um, now, the, um, uh, this may also be a, an issue in terms of the supports that the person may need. Uh, for instance, if they have issues with communication, um, uh, who, who's going to support them with their form of communication that they use? So this is not necessarily always going to be the case, but there are people for whom they really do need assistance with their communication, and you've got to build that in somehow, however uh, they do that. Uh, it's un less likely with the supporters, but there could be supporters that also have communication issues that also have to be factored in in terms of a some kind of assistance with whatever that their communication challenges uh, might be. Um, now, I haven't said really what you do in a support circle because um, there's really no prescription of what you need to do in a support circle. There's no statute that requires that you do this, that, and the other, have an individual support circle plan or whatever, you know. So um, people can then have a circle in which their relationships with their supporters are quite different from one person to another just because of who the supporter is and who the person is. Uh, for instance, uh, many people think, well, uh, this is going to lead to friendship. And uh, that may be true, but it also may be different friendships. You know, when you think about it, you know, that your, your friendship with one person is a little different than the one with the other one. So the expectation is sort of it's sort of one relationship at a time. Mm -hmm. So, yes, it's called a circle, but it's really one relationship at a time. 
And maybe the circle doesn't meet all that often, but the relationships are ongoing. And so you have a kind of dynamic where people are seeing people more one at a time. And uh, lots of things can, can happen collectively, you know, and so on, like dinners and outings and so on. But a lot of things may be just one-on-one. -on -one. That's how people want to do things. They want to go shopping or they want to go to an event or something like that. Um, uh, so just a couple of things support, support circles aren't. And the first would be that they're not a professional service, you know. People could turn them into something like that, you know. I have my master's in support circle, and, uh, you know, I've been worked in many circles, you know. Uh, so another would be they're not a panacea for uh, all of a given person's needs. You know, you got a support circle, you're, you're out of the woods. Uh, it will meet uh, some of people's needs, but not necessarily everything. Uh, so remember to think of circles as having great benefits, but possibly limitations of one kind or another. Um, uh, and the circle isn't there to solve all the problems in the person's life. It is there if it can be helpful. But it is not meant to be a kind of panacea solution to everything like a, uh, you know, kind of a quick fix or whatever. And they're not always stable in the relationships. Uh, people do come and go in people's life uh, for one reason or another. And so circles are constantly being rebuilt in many cases. You know, somebody, you know, uh, leaves, another person comes, and so the composition may change. And it's not always a replacement for uh, professional supports. Many people frame it as that, but it isn't really. It, you can have both. Uh, and it's, they're not easy to keep on track because a circle of people all have their own minds, and uh, what they may be spending a lot of their time as is uh, essentially uh, pulling in different directions. So this is just the nature of the dynamics of people with different sort of mindsets. Uh, and it is also true that it's, it can be hard to recruit the right supporters. And, and in fact, most of you might recruit not so right supporters in, in the idea of being helpful. Uh, and people will come with their own conflicts of interest as a supporter that can be complicated at times. So as long as you're aware of that, uh, it's not the end of the world. You can see, you know, that you can, that we can make this work, but, you know, there's some, some things to be, uh, to be mindful of. So that's just a short sort of introduction to the idea of support circles. And uh, I don't think we'll take comments or questions right now. We just want to make sure we get, get uh, um, Katina's uh, time. So do you want to sure. do it from there or here? What would you guys like? Can I sit or do you want me to stand? Okay. I think I, I think I think I'll just stay right here if that's okay. Can folks hear me? Yeah. Okay, great. I just want to say thank you to Michael. It is an honor and a privilege to be here at IIMHL or in IIDL and definitely um, presenting with Michael. We have been privileged in Georgia to have Michael travel down and spend some time with us, consulting with us in many ways. And so you'll hear when I talk um, on why this is a, a great fit for us to be on the same platform together. So thank you, Michael. Um, so before I get started, I do want to ask Michael if he wouldn't mind just stepping back on the mic for just a second. And you can act, no, you can actually do it from your seat, Michael. You can actually oh, okay. do it from right there. Um, Dr. Dr. Wolf Wolfensberger is someone that was a dear friend of Michael Kendrick, and some folks that are in the room knew him very well. And I want to talk about how it touched my life, but I would like Michael to say a little bit about Dr. Wolfensberger. Is that okay? Well, it's, uh, he was very famous for many things, one of which was being quite unpopular <laughs> with uh, many people because he was known to be a bit cutting-edge critical of a lot of things, but he was, he was a, a very bright guy who was the, the founder, really, of um, uh, uh, a number of things, one of which is what uh, Katina's going to be talking about, which is citizen advocacy. He was the founder of it, but he was also the founder, in a sense, of 
normalization, social role valorization theory. Mm -hmm. There are a long list of other things that he was, uh, one of which uh, was that he uh, was very uh, influential in back in the days of the deinstitutionalization uh, because the normalization was seen as a way to uh, get people lives in the community and to get them out of places like institutions and sheltered settings and so on. So that's a little bit on Wolfensperger. Thanks. That's exactly what I wanted Michael to say, <laughs> and a little bit more. But no, truthfully, um, what touches my heart more than anything about Dr. Wolfensperger, because I did have an opportunity to meet him before he, he passed away, and um, how Dr. Wolfensperger came to think about and conceptualize citizen advocacy was from this universal concern, a question that still is the same universal question concern today that I hear very often, and that is what will happen to my son or daughter when I'm no longer here. And because of the great work that Dr. Wolfensberger did, citizen advocacy is being practiced in five different cities in Georgia. And not only in Georgia, but we're happy to say that also around the world that we can, that we're happy that Citizen advocacy is being practiced in Nebraska, Pennsylvania, Massachusetts, New York, Prince Edward's Island, and Australia. But I, what I'd like to say that in Georgia, we are so thankful that when the Georgia Advocacy Office was put into place, which is our PNA, there was a promise that was put in place in 1976, and that is to fulfill the PNA promise in Georgia. So as you see the promise up here, I'd like to read that to you, which is citizen advocacy will mobilize many ordinary citizens of Georgia in personal relationships. When Michael was talking about the circles, you will hear how those circles are formed in citizen advocacy. Those relationships will build the foundation for assuring that people with disabilities are free from abuse and neglect and have advocates for the support they deserve to have and live good lives in our communities. That promise also said that we would develop and support local attorneys to represent people with disabilities whose rights have been violated. The promise also says that we will educate and support families and local citizens who encounter barriers to school inclusion. We promise to also collaborate with other advocacy groups to respond to complaints caused by systematic failure or incompetence. We also promise to provide skilled responses to cases of abuse and neglect. That is the GAO promise in the state of Georgia. So what is citizen advocacy? Just in a brief, short form, it's what Michael was talking about with the circles, but citizen advocacy is very intentional on building a one-to-one -one freely given relationship between two people, one with a disability and one without a disability. One person who's living on some pretty thick ice in life is good, and one person who's living on some very thin ice and needs some protection. Citizen advocacy is seen as just one way to provide that protection and advocacy to defend the welfare and interests of and justice of persons with a disability. It also builds and strengthens community. Citizen advocacy relies on the competency of just ordinary citizens. I really like this definition that, that Wolf thought of when he thought about citizen advocacy, like what is a citizen advocate, like a description of who the person is. And he writes, and then I'll explain a little bit more, a valued citizen is what a citizen advocate is, who is unpaid and independent of human services, then creates a relationship with a person who is at risk of social exclusion. The citizen advocate then chooses one or several of many ways to understand, respond, and represent that person's interest as if they, they were the person's own, thus bringing the partner's interests and gifts and concerns into the um, ordinary circle of ordinary life. But what Wolf was talking about when he said a valued citizen, because we value everybody. Everybody in this room is valued. He was talking about people, like citizen advocates, a citizen advocacy office looking for citizen advocates who are very connected in their community, who have a lot of connections, who's very resourceful. That's what he's talking about when he talks about valued. That goes back to the circles that Michael's talking about. We're looking for people who are very connected in their communities and who's very resourceful. So. Why are Michael and I, we're sharing this platform because there's some compatibilities with this life-giving and supportive decision-making 
and citizen advocacy that we both like to share. The first is both provide the opportunity to create and sustain long-term relationships. Those circles, you need those circles not just for one month, two months, a year, two years. We need it long-lasting, right? So same thing with citizen advocacy relationships. Both rely on natural supports as a way of getting things done. Who do you want in the circle? Both are carried out one person at a time. Michael said you can have one person or you can have several people, as many people as you want in your circle. Both are intended to be ways to support the best interests and rights of a person who is vulnerable. Both uphold a person's rights. The specific needs of the person determine the support given in both. And when I'm talking about both, we're talking about supported decision making that Michael's going to come back up and talk to you more about. Both support decision making and citizen advocacy seek to help a person to get the good things in life. Both seek to ensure that the decision making that's made is made by the choice of the person. Both involve a partnership between the person and the committed allies. Again, building those circles, those strong circles. Both exist independently of formal service systems but can cooperate with these systems on behalf of the person. So what I want to do is kind of walk you through a couple of stories that's going to help you understand a little bit more about what we mean as our presentation was entitled, Some Long-Term Examples of Intentional Personalized Life-Giving. Like, what are we talking about when we're saying this life-giving? I pulled out some things that I like to highlight and a couple of quotes that kind of help bring this together before I talk about the three stories and then we'll share a video. And so Wolf he would call these life-giving themes. Life-giving, an advocate, commitment, and determination. When you hear these quotes by citizen advocates who've been in relationships of these relationship circles for a very long time, this life-giving of, I look at him like he was me, and then I help him. The life-giving of, I've got to be there for him, he has no one else. Life-giving, and advocates express a sense of reciprocity with protégés. Getting to know each other is important in our friendship. We have gotten to know each other through many different ways. We confide in each other. We will grow in our friendship forever. We are now friends and extended family to each other. When she needs me, I am there for her. Forsaken all other business and forsaken everything else, she has come to be come by my side, and I have been and stood by her side. Life-giving, unexpected general benefits, and a, in a world which values the perfect, the healthy, and the beautiful, as advocates can make a difference in the lives of people with disabilities, you will hear in this life-giving that the advocate will say, in return, a wonderful difference is made in my life because I was involved in citizen advocacy. I was involved with a person with a disability. Life-giving, the benefit of the gift of friendship, love or concern for the protege. Some advocates are deeply touched by the way their protege comes to love them and care for them. Gary had every reason not to trust me. He had lived a very long life of institution, but he gave me the gift of love. Life-giving, what a treasure to have affection and joy offered so freely and willingly. Life-giving is also a theme that Wolfensberger would say enjoyment and fun in their relationships. One thing many advocates would say is that my protege and I, we laugh often. We laugh a lot. A 32-year-old man who had spent 16 years in the institution, he chose Mary to be his advocate. Mary reported that Ray and I faced serious problems together, but some of the things I have been through with Ray have been funny, and we do a lot of laughing together, life-giving. We have great times together. We have fun together, whether it's just the two of us. Life-giving of the unexpected teacher that advocates have learned from their protege. I have learned so many things from Deborah. When an advocate discovered that different well-meaning strangers kept giving her protege um, 
shampoo and toiletries and a comb until it filled up the chest of the protege. The advocate then said she learned that the gift that really mattered come from people who know us well. People that know you well are not going to keep giving you shampoo and toiletries and a comb year after year after year. But the most enduring lesson in this life giving has been that for one person to be truly present with and accepting of another person is perhaps the best thing any of us can give each other, life giving. People with disabilities want the same thing that I want, a home, a real job, friends, life giving. Michelle's disability is not the most important part of who she is. So you're, I'm going to walk you through some stories real quick, and you'll get a chance to see some of the life giving. And then I'll share a video at the end. This first story is about a woman by the name of Deborah. She was involved in a car accident when she, well, actually it was her and her baby that was involved in a car accident when she was 17 years old. It resulted in a traumatic brain injury for both. The mother at that time became Deborah's citizen advocate. Or she became her guardian. And then there were complications and the mother could no longer be the guardian and so she passed it on to public guardianship. A citizen advocate was recruited to get to know Deborah and she got to know Deborah in a very, very passionate way and she decided to petition the state to become her guardian only because she wanted to release the guardianship or release, help Deborah restore her rights. So Deborah was afraid because she had never, you know, been opposed to this before. Michael came down, spent a lot of time getting to know Deborah and Lisa, and so now Deborah has been practicing this decision making to um, restore her rights back to herself. And then in this life giving that we're talking about, one of the things that Lisa says is that I'm going to let every, I'm not going to ever let anyone push her around. I mean, she provides that protection and advocacy for Deborah. When we think about life giving, here's a young man by the name of Matthew who was born in 1999 and. He went into foster care at the age of four after moving around a lot throughout the state. When he was thinking about graduating from high school, he thought about all the things that he would do that we did, which is go to work or go to college. But the foster care mom who didn't know much about what a path would look like for a typical teenager felt like his path would be the day program. So recruiting an advocate for him, you know, the advocate had children and she you know, believed so much that her son and daughter would do such well, well in life that she talked to Matthew and got to know him and said, what would you like to do? And so she supported him. He decided that he wanted to go to Job Corps, and that's where he is today. And one of the life-giving things is that the advocate says, Matthew makes me happy to see all he wants to be, says the citizen advocate. Life-giving. This young man by the name of Crawford, when you meet him, he puts a smile on your face because the first thing he says is, I used to be an all-star basketball player in high school. And then he said, but then I was in a car accident when I was 17 years old, sustained a traumatic brain injury. Right after finishing high school, I went right into a day program. I spent half my time at a day program and half my time taking care of my mom. But he says that, you know, I want a job. I really do want a social life. At the time, before Michael started coming down to talk to us about supported decision making, which you'll hear next, the mom was really concerned and thought that maybe he needed a guardian. But after hearing that that's not good to take someone's rights away, the mom changed her mind and decided that that wasn't a good idea. So, support, so through supported decision making, mom made a conscious choice that Crawford could do anything that he wanted to do on his own. So Crawford is happy that he was able to keep his rights. So I want to share this really short video with y'all to kind of like wrap up this life giving that Michael and I are really talking about. It's very, very passionate. A very deep thing, and um, there's a colleague of ours that did citizen advocacy for 40 years, and he said something that will always stay with me, and he said that if people are not loved, people are not safe, and so when we think about our own selves and our own lives, we're all surrounded by advocates, whether you call them an advocate or not, it's your mom, your dad, it's your grandma, it's your grandpa, it's your nieces and nephews and cousins and friends, like we're surrounded by people that are in our circles, and we don't call them, you're my circle, you don't say that you're my advocate. But that's what they are. There are support people that love us. And so I'm so happy to, that this young man in Crawford, who Michael had an opportunity to meet, and um, when you spend time with Crawford, he lets you know that in spite of what he's gone through, he really um, takes pleasure and pride in making people smile. Like, that's his main thing. 
And so we thought really deeply about Crawford and his life and who would be the right person to stand beside Crawford? Like, who is this person that needs to come in Crawford's circle? Well, we need to find somebody who has something in common with, with Crawford, somebody else who likes to make people smile and make people laugh. And so we approached the comedian that was in our community, and uh, he met Crawford, and they fell in love with each other, each other because they really do like the same things. They like making people smile. And so when they put this short video together, I asked them if I could share it because I thought it really, really helps with people understanding what this life-sharing, life-giving thing is all about that we are doing with one another even these past two days. Um, I think that you all will, will like it. So if the video crew can pull up the video for me, though. My name is Crawford Lana. How y'all doing? That, that's a great intro. All right. So Crawford, I'm going to hit you with some, some prompts. And what you're going to do is just riff on these prompts. What's your least favorite food? Riff on it for a minute. Squash. <laughs> it doesn't sound, it sounds delectable or something like that. Like, yeah. <laughs> they're like, I want to I go to the house to get some squash, man. You too? <laughs> I mean, I was thinking the same exact thing. <laughs> that's right. But. Yeah. So good to be here with you. Hey, man, you on break. I know you miss all day. You know, you and I, when we hang out, we like to keep things kind of light. I'm a comedian, and it's part of why we get along. Uh, I thought I knew. <laughs> one of the thing, things that, like, drew me to you immediately yeah. was that you remind me of one of my favorite comedians of all time. You remind me of Richard Pryor. You have natural timing. That's Which what, is a gift. That's that's what other people say. This one comedian I was talking to up in Atlanta, he was he, he said he said you ever thought about being a comedian? I said I didn't really think of it. I said no. Why? He said I had to train for a while to get the time, and what you got on the money? I said oh how much money I get paid? What you think? <laughs> so to get serious for like just a second, mm, what, you? what happened to you when you can can you tell the folks like what happened to you when you were a young man? So my, when I was in the accident? Yeah. Yeah, it was like this. I, I, the first thing happened, the tire blew out. And then no one knew how to change the tire correctly, but I did. And uh, I began to change the tire. And once I got it on, I did like this. And remember a bright light. So it must have been the impact of the 18 wheeler. But that, that, was, that was all I remember. I remember this lady said, would you like another pudding cup? See, I was in the hospital. I couldn't talk. And I could shake my head, but that's all I could do. And you and you didn't know where you were? I didn't at all. I thought it was, I didn't know one of the things, so I was just shaking my head. Like one minute you were on the street changing the tire, and next minute you're getting asked about a pudding cup and Dr. Pepper. That's exactly what I'm talking about. That's crazy, man. I know I have a memory problem, and I would see that same person, but and I would be talking to that person every every now and then, but then I hate to, I, I hate to bother y'all, but what's your name again? You know, my memory is so short. It scared me because I don't like to I, I like to I remember your face and I remember it well, but it's just a name. And then I just realized I had to accept that because that's the way I am. Is that what keeps you positive? Yeah, because I'm going through this for a reason. I'm not going through this just because it happened all of a sudden and the Lord did this for, for a reason because he chose me. I could have been hit by 18 well, I must have been gone, but he chose me to go through this because he had a purpose for me being here. I'm meant to be here. For a reason. Sure, everybody, it's not over just because you have an accident or something like that. It's, it's some reason, some things, like dominoes, they fall behind each other because they're supposed to fall that way. Sometimes you're supposed to be someplace so you can meet that person, and not, 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 not as far as a relationship, so just so you made that person day, and you just say, you know, you don't know, that might make the person's life better. That one little, everybody deserves to be treated equally. As good as you can do. But everybody don't see it the way I respect you the way you do. That's the way I am. I believe in why not share love with the world? If I can do that. The Lord shared love with me, waking me up this morning. That's just the way I am. pass it back to Michael, but I was just going to share real quick that, you know, before working at the Georgia Advocacy Office, I spent 
10 years bringing people together in relationships and and building circles for people that was so necessary and sitting with people um, not really understanding and knowing what to do, but just bringing someone in their life just to get to know them, to care about them just a little bit, change not only the person's life that have the disability, but it transformed the person's life that was the advocate. So this life-giving um, conversation that Michael and I were able to talk about, I've, I see it all the time, and it's the most powerful thing that I've ever witnessed in its relationships. So let's keep building strong circles. Back to you, Michael. Okay, well... Um, I'm going to switch gears to say a few words about supported decision making. And um, uh, I think I'll start with the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, which is a major piece of international legislation uh, done through the UN that largely uh, led to the recognition uh, that guardianship is problematic. Mm -hmm. And why is it problematic is that uh, if people are placed under guardianship, they have lost their rights. And those rights are now in the hands of the guardian. And so the person really has, uh, it, in, a, in a very legal sense, uh, can't uh, be treated as the, the decision maker in their own life on any matter that has any legal consequence because they do not have legal authority to uh, decide things in their life. This is the problematic nature of guardianship. And guardianship also has another problematic dimension to it, and that is it's been around for several thousand years mm -hmm. in one form or another. So it's deeply entrenched not just in our culture but in many cultures. And so uh, what are we to do if people are to get their rights back? Mm -hmm. And this is uh, what people have struggled with, uh, really, and that the UN Convention tried to do, which is to recognize that there is such a thing as the restoration of people's rights. Even if you have taken their rights away, you can also get those rights back. And that's very important, and uh, we're now starting to see in many jurisdictions, in many countries, of people that have reversed guardianships and uh, su uh, su su supplanted them with things like supported decision-making. The idea being that uh, <clears throat> people still may need support with their decisions even if they get their rights back. And uh, if you just follow any of us around for a week or two, you'll realize how many bad decisions we all make. <laughs> Um, and, and, you know, and it's often your friends that will point them out to you. That's true. There you go again, doing <laughs> dumb things, you know. Uh, so the test of whether you keep your rights can't be that your decision-making is 100% perfect. We covered that in the advanced program, but, you know. The reality is, uh, with supported decision-making, then, is to give people the support that they can have a better chance of making good decisions. But that's not the same as saying every decision you're going to make is going to be good. Because how many people in this room have uh, batting 100% on personal decision making? <laughs> Some of you are on your 16th divorce. I'll say no more, you know. <laughs> so uh, decision making is problematic. And uh, so this is where support decision-making comes in. And by the way, you could practice it even with people that are still under guardianship because they can still make good decisions notwithstanding. So you know, the legal process and the practice may be on somewhat different uh, 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 sort of levels. But support decision-making um, uh, in North America uh, Really, the place in North America where there was the most progress has been actually in British Columbia. Uh, but it wasn't called support decision-making. It was representation agreements. Uh, but the Canadians developed a system that is essentially a supported decision-making system for uh, pe people who are elderly, people with uh, intellectual other disabil developmental disabilities, and people with mental health needs. Uh, and... Uh, that system uh, has been in place for a very long time. It's not controversial 
uh, all that much in British Columbia. The, a very similar system was set up in the uh, Canadian province of uh, Alberta and in the Yukon Territories. And so in this sense, we have the, a very long-running evidence that you can get people support with their decision-making uh, such that you know makes guardianship kind of irrelevant. You don't really need it. Uh, so the idea that guardianship is the only way you can pre protect yourself isn't, isn't the case. You can get uh, protection in the sense of having support. And uh, people without support are going to make poorer decisions. That's just the long and short of it. Whether you're under guardianship or not, um, that is a, a reality. So I'm returning to this issue of support. Now, um, uh, to, just to add, though, uh, another wave uh, happened uh, after the British Columbia experience that I said, you know, resulted in the uh, UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, uh, which uh, then spread the uh, practice of support decision making into other jurisdictions. And there are now activity on support decision making in many, many dozens of countries because of the UN. And it's producing, uh, you know, very interesting results depending on where you are in the world and, uh, you know, what the starting point was in that particular country. But uh, what it has recognized, and this is, I think, most people that have been involved with the practice uh, have noticed, is that people actually do better with their decision making if they're getting support. And that's not like a big aha moment, you know, if you're getting support, you're, you're going to do better. Uh, and so uh, it raises the question, who's out there that could be making their own decisions but has no one to support them? And so this is where there's been efforts to actually mobilize people to be supporters of a person so that they're getting the support with the decision making, their decision making, so have a better chance of uh, doing well with the decision making. Uh, now, do they always make good decisions? No, they're following most of you in not being very good at most decisions. How many of you have had the odd problem with decisions? Yeah. And uh, how many of you are, uh, get it pointed out to you? <laughs> Sometimes repeatedly. <laughs> like, uh, but uh, the reality is, is that isolated people that have no support with decisions are more vulnerable because they're making decisions sort of in a you know, vacuum of other points of view that might be helpful to them. And so what, uh, what we're in the stage of now, in, for instance, in North America, is we now have, for instance, in the U.S., I think there's something like 21 jurisdictions now that have some kind of statute at the state level uh, in favor of the practice of support decision-making. So that's once you get to 21 states in the U.S., it doesn't take you long to you know, get to the 30th or the 40th state. So what we have is now what might be called an imminently sort of widespread uh, uh, initiation of the practice of support decision-making. It's not that everybody's practicing or large numbers, but the framework for it is now in place increasingly in the U.S., and it's interesting, there are people have added new uh, sort of aspects to this. In the state of Alaska, uh, it's, you know, I've been, we've been talking about people with disabilities and others that might need support with their decision makings or mental health needs or addictions or whatever. But in Alaska, you can uh, practice support decision making because you're an Alaskan. That's it. In other words, that uh, support decision-making is available to anybody in Alaska who wants help with their decision-making. So you don't have to have a disability. You just may want you know, to go ahead and get, uh, figure out some ways to get some help with some uh, decisions. Yeah. So again, this is returning to the generic issue, which is that decision-making is inherently complicated. Uh, we've all just had, um, I'm sure most of you have great stories about all the home runs you didn't hit. When, when it came on uh, decision making, um, and uh, and in, many of you may have realized, well, I should have talked to a few people about this before I did that. I don't know, officer. It's the best argument I can give you. <laughs> Seemed like a good idea at the time. So 
uh, so supported decision making, even though it's now been focused in many cases on people with developmental disabilities, people with mental health needs, uh, aging populations, and so on, is really a bigger issue than that. It's really the human struggle to use the power of choice wisely. And that's going to never not be a problem uh, for any society. And so it's in the society's interest to make sure anybody that's going to struggle with uh, things without support to find some ways to get them support right. uh, with their decision making. And some of you may live long enough to even have less functional ability than you do now. In fact, some of you, I can already see it. <laughs> you know, it's sad really, but... Goodness. But that is also going to be all of us and so in this sense, even if we have strong capacities at one point in life, for any number of reasons, that, those com uh, capacities may desert us. And we'll be more vulnerable. That's true. And we'll be very, you know, much helped to get some support uh, with decisions that we didn't need support on at an earlier point. So that, that is the gist, really, of supported decision making. And it's just really this. The practice, the essence of the practice is to draw people in, to fill in the blanks in terms of decision making with you so that you can uh, make better decisions. And we do, it, we, even, we do it without thinking of it in everyday life because we turn to people that know something about the content of that decision. So if you're going to buy a car, you're going to talk to somebody who knows about cars. So. If you want to talk about a relationship issue, you're going to talk to friends that know something about that. So the targeting of support isn't like you have one universal supporter who supports you with all decisions. Mm -hmm. You can draw on lots of people depending on the type of decision you're trying to struggle with at a particular time. So in the commonplace practice of support decision making, <coughs> I think that's what most of us do. We try to think who's the most suitable person at the moment to talk to me about this decision or a number of people. Mm -hmm. Who should I go to on that particular decision? Now, why are we linking these three things together? Well, yeah. they're, the three things we've just talked about are important because they're, they capitalize on natural supports to make life easier and safer uh, for the individual that's concerned. And that's the sort of key theme in, uh, in what we've been talking about s this morning isn't just decision making, uh, but rather the, uh, uh, with, uh, the planning of our lives, the shaping of our lives so that we are more likely to be successful with what we're trying to do with ourselves. And uh, if you don't have a citizen advocate, for instance, uh, you don't have somebody in your corner. If, you know, if you're going to have to make all your decisions by yourself and uh, you know, struggle, uh, so all, each of these brings some element of support that wasn't present for people. Yeah. And again, it doesn't mean that any of these supports are foolproof. Citizen advocates can let you down too. You know, That's I mean, they, you know, they're only human. Well, they may be seemingly human. <laughs> you know. Yeah. Uh, and same with the support decision making. You can get support from poor supporters. You know, it's the way it works. So the, the idea isn't that we're building safeguards that are foolproof by doing this. We're just increasing the likelihood that we can get some better outcomes. And that's still worth doing. So, you, you know, even if you have a citizen advocate, you're going to still make some not-so-good decisions. Mm -hmm. You can have a, you know, practice support decision-making and still not make great decisions all the time and so on. But it is possible to improve and to strengthen the likelihood of better outcomes. And so when we talked about this as life giving, that's what we meant, that it gives to our lives a chance for a better life. And that is very life giving. And so in, if you think of it that way, making good decisions can be very helpful. Mm. How many of you get up every day and say, oh, I wish I could make some more really poor decisions today, you know? <laughs> I'm just in the poor decision mood, you know? <laughs> I want to give it a run. But most of us wouldn't want to do that because we'd like to be able to make decisions that are good for our life. Right. And so this is what the essence of uh, this practice is. And uh, you do not need a legal permit to carry supported decision making. 
you know, you can just do it. And nobody's ever been arrested for supported decision making that I know of, at least, or having a citizen advocate or uh, whatnot. Um, but one good thing I think that uh, you know we need to point out is people that used to uh, have uh, a guardian don't have one today. And it's, we've started small, yeah. but in every jurisdiction now we're seeing people going back to court uh, to restore people's rights. So, uh, and that's, all things start small, but uh, one could imagine that at some point, guardianships at, at best will be temporary and time limited. Mm -hmm. you know, and you have to renew them if that's the case, whereas now guardianship, you get it, you got it for the rest of your life. But what about a type of guardianship that's sort of temporary or very narrowly focused, almost like partial guardianship and so on? These options will increase in terms of what people's preference would be. So that's what's important here. It's still early days, but these practices, citizen advocacy, support decision making, whatnot, are going to be more widespread if you're interested in learning more about them. There are all kinds of resources now out there. So this morning we didn't want to really, you know, this wasn't going to great depth, but just give a bit of a bird's eye view of three different uh, key strategies that are underway at the moment uh, and, um, uh, and uh, that they can complement each other. Yeah. This is very, sorry about that. Uh, I, need a, I need support in the worst way. <laughs> It's happening with greater frequency and so on. Okay, we'll stop there then. <laughs>